Oh, man. We are back after year three of Colorado Festival of Horror, and I still have not gone... This is Kofo Live in Undead. I am your host, Daniel Crozier, and I am joined by the amazing Steve Orlando. Steve, how are you, sir? That was the best intro I've ever seen. Uh... <laughs> Thank you. I I aim to please. <laughs> I'm a little sad. I'm a little sad you didn't send me something to drop on my fucking face like right now uh, when I came on. Oh, I know. We could have done like the the carry challenge, right? <laughs> I well listen. The thing is, um, if, I don't know. If, I don't know if GalaxyCon has ever come to um, the Colorado area, but I'm a big fan of GalaxyCon in general. One of the reasons is, you know, we do all these panels at conventions and things like that, and it's always exciting to talk to people. But they do get a little rote, you know, after right. after a while. But at Galaxy, uh, two cons ago in in North Carolina, I know the promoter pretty well at this point, so he knows that I'm pretty much game for anything. And I showed up to this panel and found out that it wasn't a panel. It was it was fam um, it was Family Feud, but with but it was comics creators versus voice actors. So I'm up there like doing Family Feud against fucking Master Shake and stuff like that. But <laughs> the thing is, after I was like, fuck this, like I you know I want to do Family Double Dare, like I want to yeah. get fucking slimed. So yeah. um, you know now now it's back in my mind because that was your intro and 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 it was also extremely metal. Um, not dream evil, but I, but I feel like this could be one of the podcasts where I bring up the band dream evil and someone knows who it is. Ooh. Ooh. Um, uh, yeah. I, unfortunately, I don't know who that is, but hopefully one okay. of our watchers will, will tune in. I was on with Rich from the Matt man and he's the only other person that's ever really known about dream evil, but they're just like a good schlocky, like they're a modern band that does throwback eighties, early nineties metal. All their songs are like. The Book of Heavy Metal or Evilized or shit like that. Nice. Um, very much my bag. But anyway, that's definitely what you have me on to talk about, right? Like early 90s Swedish uh, homage metal. Yes, exactly that. <laughs> so let's get very specific. What Please. do you think of uh, Icelandic Black Death Metal? Wait, is that the one where they killed a guy for real and they made a movie about it? Or is that something else? No, I think that's that. I think that was part of the, uh, um, you know, the the larger, uh, you know, European continent, uh, you know, that that happened on. I don't think it was Icelandic, but who there knows? Was, There's there really was. not a lot to do in Iceland. <laughs> well, and even less if you keep killing people. Um, True. Yeah, True. no, there was some. I was looking up some form of black metal, and I wasn't aware of it really. But I think Bill mm -hmm. Skarsgård or someone like that was in a movie. Right. Based on this band, where one they where they really did kill one of the members, um, which I'm not I'm not pro killing members of your band, by the way. Like, yeah, don't do that. But I was like, oh shit! So this is like, you know, yeah, this, this is a real thing that happened. Uh, but regardless, that's not my brand of metal, folks. We're not pro murder metal. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no pro uh, murder metal. Okay. Oh, geez. Let's let's hope we didn't invent a genre. Anyway, disclaimer: killing's bad. <laughs> unless you're killing time uh there you but, go but uh yeah no i'm excited to be on it's been man probably at least five years since you and i met because i've just like yeah. allowed for me to come back to colorado um but i liked colorado so hopefully i will be back soon yeah uh yeah it was yeah it was great uh meeting with you um uh, yeah steve siegel uh introduced us i think we all went out to, to dinner or something like that Food and, hall. Uh, I wouldn't remember the name, but we went to a food hall with a bunch of different types of locations inside. Yeah, yeah. 
I love those. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's basically an expensive, uh, you know, smorgasbord of, of all kinds of different things. Yeah, no, fancy. It's a bougie cafeteria, and I myself am bougie, so like that totally works for me. Nice, nice. Uh, Steve, uh, for our, our uh, you know, viewers, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got into comics? Sure. Uh, well, I started, uh, well, the story of me getting into comics is also the story of how you and I met. I, I started, uh, I mean, I've liked comics since I was but a lad in the 1980s. Um, my father's a non-sports, or pardon me, my father's a sports memorabilia dealer, um, but I didn't really like sports. So when we would, when we would be at card shows and things like that, I would always gravitate towards the non-sports cards. And that usually meant uh superhero comic book cards whether it was dc or marvel it also meant like elf and garbage pail kids um things like that so i would gravitate towards that stuff there and then we were when we would do flea marketing to try to pick up stuff i in the same way i would pick up comics out of the what at that time were probably like the 10 cent or five cent bins and those are the first books i read um it wasn't until i was like 12 that we got a comic store in my on my side of the city and I realized this is what I wanted to do. And it was the same year that I started going to cons. I, I, it was like some real standby me shit. I collected cans all year so I could go to Chicago Comic Con at wow. that time, Wizard World Chicago. Um, and, uh, and that's where I met Steve Siegel and Joe Kelly. Um, and I asked them how to do this job. Um, the, the connection, as folks have maybe already hinted at, also how I met Daniel uh, mm -hmm. through Steve Siegel. Um, but, you know, at that time I was 12 years old and he told me if this was my, if I wanted this to be my job, I should treat it like one and write every day. And he'd either see me in a year with a new comic pitch or he wouldn't, you know, and that was kind of his line to everyone, although everyone was probably not 12 years old, but I was a stubborn son of a bitch. So I did. I came back every year with new concepts, sometimes twice a year at different cons for the next eight, uh, 19 years. And uh, at the end of that, I had something that was publishable. And as he promised, he put it in the hands of Eric Stevenson from Image Comics. And that's how I got my first book, uh, Undertow. At the same time, I had been like networking with DC and Marvel to an extent, but especially DC, because as a, a young adult reader, I tended to like DC more, even though I was Marvel Comics or my first comics. And, uh, and so like... I had done like shorts. I did a short at Image Comics. I did a short of Vertigo in 2012 that was approved by Karen Berger, which for me was like, you know, oh, a fucking Rolling Stone, basically. That's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, and then in 2014, I got another one. Um, and those things were happening in parallel. And, and that's sort of how these stories converge. Because once I had those, it was kind of like, what's next? And that's when I could point to this image book and say, look, you can show this to the editor in chief. You can show this to your bosses. Then this shows that Steve can like do a book and is professional and creative, all these things. So it was kind of like these two different tracks converging at one time. And that was 2014. That's when the bad girl of Burnside uh, happened. And mm -hmm. it, they were, there was just a really uh, time, a rife time for reinventing characters and spotlighting se uh, relatively second tier characters. I would, uh, I'm sure bad girl is an A tier for many people, but in the publishing sense, she's not one of the big seven. Right. And so that's how something like Midnighter came about. It was, you know, right place, right time after 20 years. Um, and and can we jump on this momentum of Bad Girl of Burnside? Uh, and what would you do, Steve? And, and that's how the pitch for Midnighter got started. That was 2014. And, you know, we were out on stands June 2015. Wow. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Somewhere around there, I think, uh, like, uh, um, what was it, uh, 215 Inc.? uh you you got some work uh published uh through them as well right oh i mean yeah I, I was around i mean i had every job during that time you know i mean i had a job job after college like many people who graduated in 2008 the world was like go fuck yourself so i i took my liberal arts degree and learned about wine uh because my english mm -hmm. russian degrees were not really working um or i should say creative writing not english um so I got into wine at that time, but I was also doing other gigs. I was doing like, you know, I'd worked for, uh, I mean, when I was in high school, I was working as like submissions editors and things like that. I was never not making comics. And along the way, yeah, I met the guys from Two and Five Inc. I really liked this book they put out called Vic Boone, which was, right. by, uh, which was by Sean Aldridge. And I believe an artist whose name is escaping me. I'm not purposely doing that. I'm just pulling this from memory. Um, and and I got to know those guys pretty well. And we, we put together a book called The Kitchen Witch, which we then did sort of a short run. And then once I had broken into Marvel in DC, we did a re-release 
um, sort of a remaster, I think about two years ago. Cool, man. That's, uh, that's pretty awesome. Um, recently I, I was working with, uh, you know, they rebranded as invader and mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that they just, uh, um, announced a new, uh, Vic, uh, Boone, uh, you know, book. I did not know that I'm finding out live on this, on this, on this podcast, but I, but I love Vic Boone. I, and I love, listen, the folks at two and five slash invader, they're, they're dedicated. They want to make great books and, and that's the energy I want out of anybody. So they're not the yeah. biggest, picture, but I love the stuff they do. Size doesn't always matter. Right. Right. With publishing. <laughs> yeah. With publishing. Um, Man, no, that's uh, that's pretty cool. The when you were at uh, DC, uh, were you also working with? Uh, uh, was it um, Will Dennis? Yeah. So the funny thing is, is that Will is where that second track came from. You know, mm. I didn't I didn't meet him in Chicago, but I met him the same year, actually at Ithacon, um, because we're both from upstate New York. So nice. Will, you know, I rolled up to this convention in Ithaca for folks who are not from upstate, which is, you know, most of the country. That's where Cornell is, the college. Um, and it's like a small little valley gorge town. It's very cute. It's about 45 minutes south of Syracuse. and But there's not a lot going on. Um, right. so, so, you know, I, I, Ithacon was in like a library foyer. And it's just me and this tall ginger guy in his late 30s. And I was like, what do you do? He was like, what do you do? And I said, oh, I write this book for, I think their name was Bloodfire Publishing. The, the book I was writing for them, this was when I was, again, like 13 or 14. It did not come out. Bloodfire Inc., maybe. Wow. Uh, but I said, oh, that's what I do. What do you do? And he, he said, oh, I'm the editor of Hellblazer. Oh, and uh, which was true. And yeah. I was like cool i'm just gonna poop my my pants right now so right uh but once he got over that and i came back from the restroom we 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 got to be i mean a, a similar type of friend as me and siegel where you know will sort of he liked the cut of my jib as they you know would say back in the day and and uh was always willing to like take a look at my scripts take a look at my pitches and help me mold them into something doable and that's how those gigs at vertigo happened you know, like in 2012 and 2014, that was finally I had amassed enough of a style and reputation where he could offer me something short. And that's how he did my first thing in Strange Adventures and also the the yellow issue of CMYK. Actually, my, that Strange Adventures came out in the same cycle as Tom King's first work ever. We're still friends, mm. uh, but we actually broke in the same cycle, though. He was in Time Warp, uh, uh, which was one of their other quarterlies that year. Nice. Wow, man, that's. That's cool. Talk about, you know, staying, uh, you know, dedicated to your craft. I mean, you know, going all the way from you know, essentially uh, middle school, it sounds like. Uh, yeah, probably sixth grade. I don't remember what grade I was in when I was 12, to be honest, because I barely remember how I got here today. Um, <laughs> it was probably, yeah, it was probably, well, it would have been the summer. So between fifth and sixth grade. Yeah. The, uh, you know, kind of, uh, kind of looking at to your your career, I mean, yeah, uh, taking on Moon Knight or Midnighter, and uh, Midnighter and Apollo, which is you know where you know I, I know a lot of you know your work, and then coming all the way to like you know I just got done reading uh, um, like five or six issues of Scarlet Witch, um, you know two totally you know different yeah uh, you, know, you know books, but uh, you know something like Midnighter just so dark and gritty. But uh, but also, you know, kind of uh, taking a, uh, a gay character and and put him at the forefront. I mean, that's uh, yeah, I, I thought that was such a fantastic you know take on uh, a character that, you know, I think uh, when it was at Wildstorm was essentially uh, uh, like a, a their version of uh, Batman or, you know, something in that vein. Um what, what was it like uh, you know, to take on you know, a character like that and really put your stamp on it? Uh, I mean, look, like he was created as a, well, him and, and, and Apollo were created as a pastiche, mm -hmm. uh, a satire of Batman and Robin. Midnighter mm -hmm. specifically was originated as What If the Shadow was by John Woo. Like that was the, was the, the quote from the original creator. Nice. Um, but the thing is, is that like satire does not mean and pastiche does not mean mockery, right? Like the original right. interpretations. Now, of course, I think that under some well-intentioned, but maybe not experienced in, you know, queer 
things creators it's maybe he may be going off the rails but i but but i don't think the characters ever created to mock gay couples i think it was right. it was it was i mean it was wildly progressive at the time yeah. and also subversive i mean it was he was a big character for me you know yeah. back in 1998 when he debuted i was 13 mm. and you know back then you didn't really have any you know, I was struggling when it, for representation that actually felt right. relatable to me, because to be honest, there's nothing wrong with the type of characters we were getting on TV. There's nothing wrong with someone like Jack from Will and Grace at all. Mm -hmm. But it didn't speak to me. It didn't speak to my personality, my 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 the way I move through the world and so on and so forth. So when I came across Midnighter, someone who was himself, in his case, like a gay man, but was yeah. also otherwise like very much like me. He didn't fit the mold. He was the baddest dude in the room. He was vulgar. He was violent. Um, I have never murdered someone. Again, let's go back to the beginning of the thing. But overall, his attitude in life, like he was going to be himself. And if you didn't like that, well, you can go fuck yourself. And if you really don't like it, then here's a boot in your face, right? So um, that you know, that's something I related to, and it was kind of the first time I saw a character, again, only personality-wise, that was like me, uh, like in a book. So um, really intimidating to come on to that. I mean, never mind that it was my first DC or Marvel work uh, within like the main universe. I'd done Vertigo stuff. Um, super super intimidating and and to step into the world and do a book that was the first of its kind dc and marvel had never had a, a gay male character lead a book before midnight had a solo but that was before um wildstorm had fully been absorbed into dc comics so we were really doing the first of our kind and um yeah it can be intimidating but i'm mean, it's also lucky that it's a character that i loved essentially since his inception uh and you know i I could have written that character for a long time more, you know, maybe, maybe I'll go back someday, but it was in many ways kind of like a perfect gig because I really was just putting myself in a duster, uh, at least when it comes to how he reacts to things. We were already very similar and that doesn't mean he's like a self insert or whatever fucking right. buzzword the internet wants. The fact is, is that like, you know, it, it's, it's cute today to like use that as a derogatory term, but part of our job, is finding points of connection with the characters that mm -hmm. we are writing so that our interpretations of them feel real and lived in. Right. So it was actually a great first gig for me because it wasn't as much work up front to sort of feel where his head is at as, as a character like the Scarlet Witch might be, which is years of work, mm -hmm. really, if you want to go back to Darkhold um, or some something like Spider-Man 2099. So um, it was a great kickoff gig and the response was overall very good. Um, you know, and certainly we had some people who were like, who is this guy? What is this mm -hmm. book? But if you're not angering someone, then you're just doing vanilla bullshit. So, um, but that was totally, that's, that's always totally fine in my book. That, no, that's, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that's true. You're not going to, you know, uh, please everybody, but I think uh, to, to, you know, do some kind of piece of art that has some stain power. Uh, you better be rubbing, you know, uh, kind of ruffling some feathers. Yeah. And like, and you also, yeah, I mean, like, I don't want to take shots at people that are in my own industry. So like, if you look at like the Stonewall movie, like that's a perfect example of like doing gay, doing gay films that are essentially so trying to be for everybody that they're for nobody. Mm. Right. Like, right. I laughed out loud, like within the first, like, never mind that the first person to throw a brick of Stonewall was not like this twinky white guy. Um, it was like trans black women. Mm hmm. But, right. you know, like he's like he's this like perfect bodied like white guy from the Midwest. And there he is like crying as he gets as he has to let an old guy blow him and all these things. And it was just like so <laughs> laughably melodramatic. Like I'm sure like I'm sure it was supposed to be dramatic, but I just like right. audibly I was like, oh, fuck yourself. Like within the first 10 minutes of this movie. So, you just know, became melodramatic. Well, yeah, but someone else's idea of melodrama, right, as well. So anyway, but like that, that's, right. that's, that's a fun digression. But the point is, yeah, <laughs> I was very happy with all the things we did in Midnighter. And, um, you know, and many things since then, I try to I try to never repeat myself with work mm -hmm. um, whenever I can. It's one of the reasons I haven't gone back to something like Midnighter because I and I, and I may someday, but I would need to have something new to say. I don't want to just do right. the same shit that I did before. Right. You know, if that's all I've got. Then it's time for someone else to come in and work pardon me, and work on that character. Yeah, you, yeah, you've, uh, yeah, like after Midnighter, 
you know, you've gotten uh, to do a number of other characters kind of pop around, you know, like Wonder Woman, uh, Martian Manhunter, Justice League America. And then, and then uh, of course, you know, you were talking before we went on about uh, um, like, uh, you know, some of your, uh, you know, more horror based, uh, you know, stuff dealing with, uh, you know, monsters in Gotham. Um, and, and, uh, and I, I'm completely, uh, you know, forgetting the actual title for, for that book, but also like Man- oh, Gotham, City Gotham City Gotham Monsters. Gotham City Monsters. Gotham City Monsters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and well, I'm, and I'm, oh, extremely, I'm, extremely, I'm extremely proud of the book. We got to do yeah. like, you know, um, Amon K. Nagwalpan is now like a superstar at DC. Um, thank you to Dave Wilgos, who was the editor of that, for telling me that, that Amon K. was on the come up. And sure enough, he was amazing. Cool. Uh, and we got to just to do wild stuff. We got to do DC's Monsters. This is right before the folks at Universal seem to be very litigious. So, like, we actually got to do, I discovered that deep in the past uh, at, um, at Fawcett Comics, at yeah. one point, Captain Marvel literally fought the Universal Monsters. And they were called, what? but but they were called the Monster League of Evil. But I promise okay. you, it was just them. Wow. And, like, we got to do it. Like, in issue five, we got to do, like, DC's Frankenstein versus essentially universal's frankenstein and all these things and uh and you know like the the veil i would say thinly veiled but we're talking like porously veiled um and and it was just a blast you know i got to create a new ghost character for the book we got to do a ton of really work that that i really like with killer croc um actually you know the next wanda story that is coming out outside of her solo is the lead in crypt of shadows which is like a, a slasher serial killer type books and her story set in the Hudson Valley with, and that is with art nice. by um, Paul as a Seda, one of my bucket list uh, people to work with. He's amazing. He's the did outcast with Robert Kirkman. Oh, um, cool. And, you know, so actually even the Scarlet Witch stuff is going a little in the horror direction come October. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's amazing. So, so we get to look forward to that. Well, October is just next week. <laughs> oh, God, that's true. Yeah, that yeah. So just in time for Halloween, that's gonna be awesome. We hope. I mean, like, I'm not the only one in that book. Al Ewing is in there. There's a lot of great character uh, creators in there. So, like, I mean, check it out. But I'm extremely happy to be in the lead of that with, again, with Paul, who I never thought I'd get to work with. Uh, I mean, he's just a killer. Um. Wow. So, and we have a cover by Lanil Yu. It's been. Uh, it'll be cool. I was very happy to have that opportunity to come across. Nice. Oh man, that's, that's awesome. What, you know, when it comes to, to writing, you know, what do you uh, tend to, to gravitate? Is it, you know, do you like, a, you know, working on stuff that's a little bit more horror based or is it just kind of a transition to, you know, focus on, on, uh, you know, more of the superhero genre or is it kind of mix and match? I mean, I like, I mean, what I like is often different than what is marketable. Like, mm-hmm. and that's just something you learn about yourself as a creator. Like, I had a come to Jesus moment. I think almost well, I, you know, next year it'll be 10 years that I've been doing this for my job with no other job. And cool. like, I think about five or six years ago, I was freaking out because I was like, oh my God, like I'm doing the books I want. And, you know, where is my like, where's my gold toilet, right? Like, where's my, right. where's my Walking Dead helicopter? Um, but, you know, I, I sort of realized I look back at the type of movies and writing I like, and all these people, like, you know, my idol is one of my idols outside of comics is Werner Herzog. He's almost 80 and oh, he still can't find yeah. funding for his stuff. Right. So I was like, oh, it's because I'm looking up to weirdos as well. Uh, you know, like, and, and Yodo is another one and he's like crowdfunding his books and or not books, movies into his nineties. Um. Uh, but I'm not going to sit here and say that if I did the Holy Mountain as a comic, that it would be like a hit in the mainstream with the Spider-Man readers. That's like, I'm well aware of that. So, yeah, that, that would be a tough adaptation that, but it's such a gorgeous film to look at. Oh, I love it. Uh, but that being said, um, you know, I do like, I really like, uh, I like mystery, but I don't mean no. like, a who done it like right. i really like the shadow is my favorite character oh, i mean cool. in all of fiction and when i say mystery i mean like that early like when the world was still when the world still had like shadows and like unexplained wow. places like i like the idea and so when i say mystery i mean like the unknown i like that the shadow's powers aren't necessarily easy to explain um i like that he sort of has a wide and strange set of abilities and he's like spooky 
And when it comes down to it, you don't get to know about him. Like, I feel like there is no other primal, like we can dress all these things up, but there's no horror more primal than mortality. And to me, that's what mm -hmm. characters like the shadow represent. And when I did the shadow Batman, yeah. like, the, that's a story about mortality. Batman is the world's greatest detective, but he is still just a man. And at the end of the day, him coming to deal with the fact and 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 coming to terms with the fact that he will never know who the shadow is because he's simply unknowable. That's the same thing as him coming to terms with his mortality. Right. You know? So like, I like, I love stuff like that. I love when things can still seem again, like dark and mysterious, but not in like an Agatha Christie way. I mean, right. like a, we don't know what's going on behind that doorway. Like, mm -hmm. and that goes for, and that goes for the type of horror that I often really like too. Like I love when things aren't, Totally explained. Uh, yeah. I love stuff like under the skin, like off the top of my head, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, just enough, but then you don't know and everything. And often whatever your mind fills in uh, is, wor is worse than, you know, what you could ever put in the screen. I mean, look at fucking look at TCM, man. Like he was going for a G rating on that because there's almost no gore on like we know all the things that happen. Yep. But yep. it's actually a relatively ungory film as as horror goes. And to me, yeah. that's also what makes it one of the best. Yeah, we just uh, screened uh, uh, Texas Chainsaw at um, Alamo Draft House uh, to kick off um, Colorado Festival of Horror this year. And we, we had uh, John Dugan and Alan Danzinger from the movie come out and, and hang out with us for that. And, and yeah, one of the things that we, we, we discussed was, yeah, in order to get screened in a number of uh, theaters, specifically matinees, yeah, you, you couldn't have, uh, you know, uh, uh, too much gore. And uh, and because of it, they ended up, uh, you know, taking you know, a little bit of a Henderson, hindrance and make it a strength. Because, man, it was so visceral by doing that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I love Wake and Fright, too, which is a little bit more of a deep cut. But if folks haven't seen it, it's a killer Australian horror movie with Gary Bond and uh, shit, the actor that plays Donald Pleasance. Um, yeah. yeah. And I mean, that's another thing. Like, there's not a lot of gore in that movie, but there is a lot of not even suspense. There's a lot of like mania. Like, like for folks who don't know, like it, it's about this teacher who's trying to get home from like he works in like the like a, a boonsy type town. He's trying to get back to the big city in Australia, but his train gets bre breaks down or something. I haven't seen in a couple of years, but he gets stuck in this this town. And everybody is super, super nice, but they're also super, super pushy. And he eventually gets like essentially trapped by their toxic hospitality uh, to the point where he's like slowly going insane. And then things start to sort of unravel. Uh, Donald Pleasance tries to kind of kill him, but kind of have sex with him. Uh, you know, but the thing is that it, it's so slow. The burn is so slow. Everybody's like, come, come stay with us. Have a drink. Have another, you know. And he like doesn't want to be rude, but before he knows it, he's basically delirious with like drink and smoke and and can't escape. Yeah, uh, and it's extremely well done. But it's one another thing like almost no one gets super bloody. There's not like any like I don't know like fucking like Friday the Thirteenth type bullshit. Um, and in a way, that's even more horrific to me. I don't know. Like I this is this is a rabbit hole. But to me, one of the most horrifying things ever put on film is in the documentary Grizzly Man. If, if you right. See yeah, with Werner Herzog. Yes. And in yep. Grizzly Man, for folks who don't know, Grizzly Man is about this dude who took his relationship with grizzly bears way too much for granted. And he eventually yep. gets him and his girlfriend get eaten by them. And uh, and this is real. It's a documentary. Uh, Timothy Treadwell. Folks can look him up. But the thing is, is that as him and his girlfriend were getting eaten, his camera was on, but the lens cap is on. Daniel already knows all these things, so I'm speeding through it. But So the lens cap is on, but they have this audio uh, of two people getting eaten alive by grizzly bears. It's horrifying. And at the end of the movie, or at the end of the documentary, Herzog, who famously is bothered by nothing. I mean, he has like one of the most stoic Bavarian personalities you've ever seen on a person. And all you see is him sitting in Treadwell's sister's house with no audio, well, I mean, no audio. You can't hear what he's listening to. And he has earphones on and he's listening to the audio of Treadwell getting eaten alive. And this guy who you know is bothered by absolutely nothing just takes the headphones off. And all he says is you can never let anyone listen to this again. 
Yeah. And to me, one of the most frightening things I've ever seen. Uh, and you don't need to see anything, right? You just know that here's this guy that nothing can bother him and he's scared shitless, right? Like, right. And, and to me, super, super effective. Yeah. Wow. That's the, uh, yeah, that, that is a, an interesting, uh, you know, you know kind of deep cut on, on that. Um, I remember watching that documentary and the, the whole time I was just so pissed off at the guy for, for having, you know, brought his girlfriend into that, uh, that, that unnecessary situation. Um, oh yeah. But, I mean, and also uh, just like, I, I mean, he's so, he's so, you know, He's so unhinged, unfortunately, like you can uh -huh. see it going bad because yep. he's treating these bears like, you know, he's like the he's like the grizzly bear version of like a person who puts their dog in a dress and has a tea party. Right. And yeah. This, but the difference is, is that your dog in most ways, 100 pounds. And like these bears are apex predators that will just kill you. Yep. Like it's, it's it's bananas. Uh, anyway, and it's also worth folks watching, as I just said, it's amazing. It is amazing. Uh, but, is. you know, the dude is unhinged. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 those documentaries that uh, Herzog puts out are just, yeah, absolutely wonderful, and uh, but they also, you know, kind of get at the root of like a, you know, like the the human uh, psyche. They just, you know, get under your skin. Um, I mean, I, I I'm not kidding when I say that he's one of my idols. I really do yeah. think. I mean, I don't under. I would one of my pet projects that I will probably never get to do because I've heard that he's game for almost anything. Um, yeah. Is I want to just save up like ten grand, and I want to pay him to just call a double A softball game because I'm sure oh it is no idea. And the film is just going to be called Werner Herzog calls a double A softball game because I'm sure he has no idea what softball is. He's probably never seen it before. And for folks who think that's impossible, he was in Star Wars and had never <laughs> seen Star Wars. Okay, so it's not implausible that he doesn't know what softball is. Oh uh, um, yeah, that. Oh my God, I. Uh... I'm happy to contribute. I'll, I'll throw in a few, uh, few dollars. <laughs> I'm putting this up myself. Uh, I just gotta. That yeah. sounds absolutely amazing. You know that, that that's that's going to be an amazing afternoon just to to witness that one live, and then you know, <laughs> however that that gets edited together. Jeez, yeah, yeah, yeah. Seeing uh, somebody like Warner pop up in uh, Star Wars, uh, that was also kind of you know just just a delightful surprise. He's and, the best and, part of Jack Reacher. That movie is like a nothing burger until you finally see Herzog with like a yeah. five minute soliloquy about the benefits of gnawing your own fingers off. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, I, I pretty much, I I pretty much skipped the Tom Cruise uh, Reacher movie. You know, so so now that uh, now that I'm aware that he's in there, I might it's actually like have to go minutes, watch. Though, dude. It's like you can just look up that you can look up that scene on the internet. Trust me, the rest is just Tom Cruise acting kind of homeless um yeah i i i never knew that never understood that when i saw that trailer it's like reacher's like this six you know eight behemoth and uh tom cruise is yeah he's he's a little guy <laughs> he's a little guy i admit i like the fighting styles he uses in that movie i mean it yeah. they're, I don't, they're not specific to jack reacher but but i do like them like i right. like he's he's a little less fancy and a little more nasty uh okay. you know but but that doesn't i mean again like we we all know that tom cruise is short so yeah, yeah. um but, but i don't mind ellen richson as reacher on amazon he's always going to be hawk to me oh um, uh from titans um True. or i guess original aquaman take your pick but um right but he's carved off a nice like sort of subgenre for himself as like the B me the, the meaty player in you know in 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 an action movie. Right. He's in right. Fast Ten as like the meaty CIA guy. So that's right. I remember yeah, you know, hearing about that. Um I've 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 kind of zoned out on the any of the fast uh, fast and furious movies. Yeah. I, I think um when I sit down and draw, you know, I'll I'll put one on, but I couldn't tell you what happened. You know, I nor mean, do I really I care. Listen, I they're so they're so bullshit and I love them so much. I can't even like <laughs> you know, I I think I peaked with six when like like Letty is like coming back from amnesia mm -hmm. and her actual line is her actual line to Dom is like, you know, oh, how'd you know that car would break my fall? And I feel like nothing sums up that better because cars don't break your fucking fall. They're nope. fucking cars. Nope. Um, that being said, like, listen, I will, I will make fun of that 
franchise, despite it being one of my favorites all day long. But I do think, listen, I'm going to do my, my bit now. Like it's yep. absurd as hell and it's only getting more absurd. I mean, they went to fucking space in nine. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, I do think it's kind of cool that like, like one of the, one of the few billion dollar franchises that's original is mm -hmm. like, it is kind of like about, I mean, people love to rip on fast for being about family. Um, and I have too, because they say it way too much, but it's not a bad idea at its core. Like the, yeah. like the idea of forgiving people and welcoming people in, it's actually yeah. relatively rare for like an action blockbuster. You know, most of them, I mean, like, it's like the anti John Wick in some ways. And I love John Wick too. Right. I love John Wick as well, rather. Um, but like, you know, those are the, that's all about like society and rugged individualism and, and everyone out for themselves for the most part. And here it's like, it's almost beyond fantasy. Like you can be trying to kill Dom with a tire iron in one movie. And by the next movie, you're at the fucking barbecue flipping burgers. Like it almost happens. <laughs> fast. Right. Um, but I do really think that that's like, I don't know, not giving up on people when you're, you know, yeah. when, when I don't know, there is something there that I think makes it special, but I'm not going to sit here and say that they're not cartoon absurd at this point. Right. But yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, the action genre is just kind of littered with a lot of uh, cynicism and, uh, and, you yeah, know, and, and gloom for the sake of gloom sometimes. The now speaking of, of films too, you know, you mentioned before uh, we, we went live that uh, uh, one of your projects just got uh, um, optioned. That's true. Well, yeah. So, so Party and Pray from Aftershock nice. uh, is out late last year. Um, it's kind of like the, like we, we always, I wrote it with Steve Fox. Um, we always kind of say it's like gay, get out, um, which is some super elevator pitch stuff, but like uh, that, that's not untrue. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we got optioned uh, and and we are, you know, we have a director, we have a cool. screenwriter that was all in the press release. So I'm not breaking news. But as folks might have noticed, something sort of got in the way for the past six months. Um, but that looks like that's wrapping up uh, tentatively. So like we hopefully are going to be back on track. I will say I've read the screenplay. Uh, so so which is surreal and very exciting. Um, so hopefully it happens. You know, I've been there before with other books, but I've never been this far. Um, and it would certainly be nice to, uh, uh, to, to make it happen. And, and the, the guy writing it, Rob Foreman, actually, it turns out he's one of the, he was, uh, I don't like, is, is it a captain? Like, like he, he, he just got elected to, to a like, position of power in the WGA. So we're very proud of him. Wow. That man, that's awesome. Congratulations. That that's going to be pretty exciting. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it, it was a real fun story to write. It's it's yeah. hard as hell. Like it is it is a it's it's an ode to '80s slashers, and it is very much that. Cool. Um, but you know, I shouldn't say but, and and I'm very proud of it. Um, and we're trying to redeem like the gay themed '80s slasher because as much as I like something like Sleepaway right. Camp, its ending is like wildly homophobic or pardon me, yeah. transphobic now. So like we can do better. Um, yeah. Not that people, I mean, shouldn't watch that movie knowing that if they want to, like it was a different time, or they, or not that people shouldn't watch it if they don't want to, knowing that. But we can do better now, so we should be doing better. Yeah, um, you know, you, know, you you've got films like uh, Nightmare on the Street uh, Two. You know, yeah, they've got uh, the um, the documentary out on on that right now. Uh, one of my friends, uh, you know, uh, CU film professor. Uh, uh, Andy Scotthill uh, was commenting in the documentary about, you know, how uh, the actor uh, was it Mark Pattinson um, was, you know, just so traumatized, you know, as, as a result of that and uh, um, how they, you know, kind of, you know, vilified, you know, his character uh, in that. And then, you know, the real life repercussions of, uh, of dealing with that being a, a gay man in the eighties, you know, in Hollywood, and uh you know ending up uh you know getting like hiv and, and all that stuff and yeah that's that's something that uh um definitely needs to be uh you know destigmatized yeah, uh, I mean, we're doing it though you know like yeah. I mean, the new chucky show i shouldn't say new it's three i think it's three seasons deep now it's great right. he's saying a damn thing about the lead being a gay a gay kid right so like right. now that there's not more work to do there's always more work to do yeah but, like we're, we're there. There's stuff out there that I think is is really hopefully rewarding for people. Cool. Um, 
right now. And I'm sure there's going to be more, not just our, not just our stuff. There's always going to be more. Right. I haven't watched the Chucky show yet. So I'm going off people saying it's good. I'm, I'm finally watching season three. Oh, but also like the interview with the vampire show is so fucking good. And it's just nice. like, it has, I, I've been shocked watching it. It's, it's so on point. And to say it's unabashed would be, would be, wouldn't even do it, do it justice. Like, like it knows what it is. It's proud of its characters and it's still great. Um, you know, I might even say it's better than the movie. Um, Ooh, nice. Well, the thing is, is that like at minimum, it doesn't, it's not just a retread of the movie. Like they, yeah. they, they, they've reworked things enough, but they're still all hitting. You're getting all the beats from the book. You're just getting them in new, exciting ways, which I think is cool. Um, but yeah, I was going to say, I'm about to finish season three of Ash vs. Evil Dead, which is funny because I just got done saying that I don't like horror that is like full of crazy kills and over-the-top stuff, but I actually don't consider Evil Dead scary at all. I love it because it's basically like Looney Tunes with, with yeah. weapons. It's, yeah, uh, Ash vs. Evil Dead is absolutely hilarious. You know, all was it? Uh, I think they only did like three seasons, right? Yes, and I've never watched this. I had watched the first two, but then I stopped, um, and now I'm rewatching them all with my. Well, we do one a year around spooky season, uh, myself nice. and my boyfriend. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I, I love Evil Evil Dead too. Is like probably one of my favorite movies ever. I love I love Ash. Like in a weird way, I equate Ash with Rocky. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, like they're both like. I mean, Ash is a gonzo version, but I feel like they're both kind of like too dumb to be unkind. And like, yeah. like when, even when Ash says something horrific, like you can tell he just is too stupid to know better. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I also just love that the only, like he's a complete fuck up except for this 1% of him that is really good at killing deadites, but he's terrible at everything else. Like truly abysmal. Yeah. The other thing in life. Yeah. Life is tough for him. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, Chucky yeah, yeah, series is is really good too. I think we're in the second season, and I just started watching uh, episodes of Interview with the Vampire. So that one's a bit of a slow burn too. I mean, it's certainly because it's interested in a lot of the. I don't. I don't even know that it, I wouldn't. I mean, like it's got gore, so but I don't know that I would consider it horror. To me, I mean, it is right. got romance, right? Like gory things yeah. happen in it, but it's really just about this fucked up relationship these two guys have. And I also just have to say, like, no shade to Christian Slater, but I fucking love Eric Bogosian and making Daniel Malloy into sarcastic Eric Bogosian was just like a masterstroke. Like, I I could watch him condescend nearly all powerful vampires for, I mean, every every week forever, basically. Nice. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, Steve, we're running uh, short on time, but, uh, you know, you, you've got uh, yeah, more Scarlet Witch coming out. And then uh, you're working on uh, Spider-Man 2099. Yeah, so there's Scarlet Witch is is uh, we hit issue ten I think early November, and then we take a little bit of a break, and then we're back in January uh, for something. I have to dance around that because that's what the press release says. And then we're back again soon after with something else that I again have to be a little bullshitty about. I apologize. Um, and then there's Crypt of Shadows, as I said, which which has a Wanda right. Stary in the lead. Um, uh, Spider-Man 2099 is a horror themed, uh, series of one shots actually, which is awesome for this wow. podcast. We're doing weekly in January. And the first one is, um, well, we already have like traditional zombies in 2099. So we're introducing a new kind of zombies. We're calling them zeros and an ode to uh, like, uh, mm. resident evil, things like that. Um, cool. and then we have Dracula in the net in the second one, we have a new werewolf by night for 2099 in the third and the fourth, we're doing terror Inc. Which, by the way, if you or anyone has not read the original Terror Inc. run, it's I remember that. Um, and then in five, we're doing Man Thing twenty ninety nine. Um, <sighs> so, like, it's funny. It's all. It's all. We never didn't have it when it comes to this podcast appearance. It's all been part of the plan. Oh my god, that is that sounds amazing. Well, I'm going to be uh, collecting a lot of Steve Orlando uh, writings here in the next uh, year. And uh, damn it, everybody that's watching right now. You better be too. <laughs> God, That's that sounds beautiful. wonderful. Ah, oh. and you know, as I mentioned uh, before we went live, I'm really digging your take on Scarlet Witch. You know, I've I've felt that uh, in the last few years, yeah, in both in two different mediums, she's been dealt kind of a raw hand. Um, and so, yeah, I, I like how you're, you know, 
making her more of a, you know, a person with, you know, some, uh, some, some baggage, some demons and stuff, but she's getting on with her life. She's doing stuff, you know, she's, and, uh, yeah, it feels very engaging. It kind of reminds me of like, um, kind of has that, uh, that feel of, uh, when Buffy came out in the nineties. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. I'll take it. Um, I, certainly my boyfriend would be happy to hear you comparing me to Buffy. Um, uh, but our theme song would be way less dated. I promise you. Hey, I, you know, whenever Buffy's, you know, on, uh, or streaming or, you know, rolls over, um, I'm fine with that opening intro. <laughs> well, respect, respect. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> uh, Cool. Uh, yeah, Steve, thanks so much for, for taking the time to, to join us and, and chat about, uh, you know, your career and, and, and just geek out on, on, uh, you know, uh, horror and pop culture and stuff. It's my pleasure. Happy to be on. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, and for everybody out there, you know, go out, uh, you know, buy, uh, Steve's books. And of course, uh, you can follow him on uh, Twitter at, uh, the Steve Orlando. Um, and of course, you know, Steve, you are the Steve Orlando of comics. Yeah, that's me. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Stick around for a few minutes, Steve, uh, while we sign off. But uh, to everybody that tuned in, th thanks so much for uh, you know coming back with us uh, for uh, the remainder of this season of uh, Kofo Live and Undead. And of course, to our sponsors, to uh, Mutiny Information Cafe. If you're going to start a revolution, make sure you're caffeinated. And uh, to Hellfire Entertainment, thanks for rebroadcasting us on your social media, Groovy TV, and of course uh, to Alien Donut Films and Joseph, uh, Angela Joseph uh, Productions, and uh, to my producers, uh, Lily Fisher, Amanda Armstrong, and Stephen Santa, Cro Santa Cruz. Uh, thanks so much for uh, keeping me in line and uh, keeping me caffeinated. Appreciate it. Uh, to everybody out there, have a good night. Be good, be kind, help each other out during tough times, and stay spooky, everybody.